My name is Dalton, and I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, building Singer Engineers. Uh, so thank you for coming. Uh, again, hello. Uh, we've had some really great talks uh, so far. How's everyone enjoying the conference? Yeah, I, I, I share your feeling. This is my first time at Strange Loop. I'm honored to, to be able to come here and, and have these great conversations and talk with everybody. And I've also noticed a trend, uh, a lot of people from different domains talking about how we really think about doing better uh, in, in whatever it is that we enjoy doing, writing software, uh, uh, building architecture, things like that. So I think that's, that's been really great and uh, that sort of aligns with what I want to talk to you uh, today about. Uh, just to get some of the formalities out, uh, I work as a software engineer at a company called Riskalyze. Uh, so we're a, a fintech startup out of Auburn, California. If you haven't heard of that, it's, it's about two hours north of San Francisco uh, in a small town up there. Uh, and we make a product for financial advisors to uh, analyze the risk in their client's portfolio. And uh, our, our real main goal is to empower a fearless investing uh, for as many people as possible. Um, and, and really what I want to talk about is, is kind of uh, my experience at Riskalyze and, and what that's kind of taught me about the community and maybe uh, some lessons that we can learn. So getting back to things, building senior engineers, uh, that's, that's an interesting title, uh, but what are, we actually, what are we actually talking about there? Uh, so let's just sort of unpack that title a little, a little bit. So uh, just to kind of bring some clarity here, uh, engineer can mean very different things. In the context of this talk, I'm gonna be talking about software engineers. That is my background. Um, and, and so I'm talking about anyone whose job is to design, architect, or build software. Uh, maybe you're called a developer, maybe you're called an engineer, maybe just a coder, uh, maybe even a designer that really specializes in, in software and application development and, and works very closely with people that write code. And so what do we mean by senior? Uh, well, what I'm really talking about is those of us that may be more advanced in our careers, uh, we're not fresh out of boot camp or out of any sort of schooling, um, and not only Maybe we do have some advanced technical skills, but also we, we've sort of uh, evolved beyond just that technical level. And maybe we've also got some skills around leadership, around uh, effective communication and kind of helping projects move along, uh, that sort of thing. And so th this could include uh, if, if you are a team lead for an engineering team, um, if you're a staff engineer, if you're an engineering manager, that's heavily involved with uh, code that gets written and uh, moving that software process forward. I'm, I'm referring to you. So why building? Well, so again, a, a lot of the content of this talk comes from my background and my observations over the past few years. And, and I've noticed that as a tech industry, uh, we can do some amazing things. We built software that connects people, that helps them to consume and share knowledge. Uh, we can solve common pain points for people, uh, maybe things that are very repetitive or boring. Uh, we can leverage software to kind of do that and, and they can go on and do things that make them more happy in their life. Or we, we, we also build things that are just fun sometimes, so games and things that just kind of bring joy to people's lives and, and enrich their lives. But I've also seen that as an industry and as a community, uh, we could do a better job of providing guidance and opportunities for career progression. Uh, depending on what your background was, uh, it seems like everybody gets to a point in their career where they're left with certain gaps, and it's kind of up to them to fill in those gaps, or maybe to find a community that can give them that guidance. And I feel like uh, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't be something that we leave up to each individual so often. So I'll talk a little bit about my journey into software development. Um, so my, my current title at Riskalyze is uh, a senior software engineer. Um, but if we go back two years ago, uh, I, I would have never imagined that, that 
that would be what you would call me. Um, if we go back maybe five years ago, uh, I, I didn't actually know how to write a for loop, but I, but I had been writing JavaScript. My background sort of came from web design. Um, the only degree I actually have is in computer technology, which basically means I can, I can be an entry-level help desk support person. I can help you fix your computer. I can uh, fix your copy machine, that kind of thing. But I was really interested in, in building things on the web and the way that there was that power to connect you. I didn't have the resources to go to school. So in my spare time, in my evenings, I would just kind of go online and, and find ways to learn this stuff. Uh, if we go back to around 2011 or 2012, I decided, you know what? I feel like I really enjoy this work. I'm just gonna dive into it head first. Uh, and so I decided to freelance. And uh, I, I didn't make much money, but I did learn that I really like application development. But that required, uh, at the time, what I called real programming. So I went back and I learned, like, I, I had been writing JavaScript and PHP for a while, uh, or, or cutting and pasting that code. I went back and, and I learned, like, what are the fundamentals of programming in JavaScript? What are the fundamentals of programming in PHP? What are those fundamentals in Python? And so I spent a few months learning Python, uh, got sort of involved in Ruby for a little bit, and, and then uh, back to JavaScript, exploring different frameworks and things like that. Also had a job for about four years where I was the entire technical staff on site. And so that gave me a lot of freedom to explore different ideas and just kind of figure things out uh, and, and kind of figure out how to make things work. But all along this time, uh, I didn't really have any kind of structured guidance. I didn't know about communities of other people doing these things. I kind of knew that they were around, but I was living in a small town in Northern California, uh, outside of San Francisco, and uh, I, I didn't see a whole lot of that around me. So, so how did I kind of progress? I interviewed a lot. Uh, so for a, over a two year period, I would, uh, was living in the Sacramento region. I grew up in Oakland, so I knew kind of what was going on in the, in the Bay Area and in the East Bay. And I had family down there. So I would drive down for an interview or, or kind of batch them up, several interviews, every three or four months. I did it in four month chunks because it was very stressful and very draining on me and I, that was all I could handle. Uh, but I'd go and, and I'd bomb some interviews and then I'd kind of uh, not get great feedback, but I kind of, take it upon myself to analyze maybe what I did wrong and see what things I could work on. And then uh, in a few more months, I'd go out and interview again. A lot of my feedback looked like this. So we're, we're looking for a more senior candidate. You're very nice, uh, you seem pleasant to work with, but we're really just looking for a more senior candidate. Um, I really didn't know what that meant. And I, I feel like we still oftentimes will give feedback like that. And, and this kind of leaves it up to the candidate to, to figure out their path. I, I think that's not a great experience, and I think that we can do better as a community. Eventually, I found channels to get useful feedback. Some of that was through interviews, where uh, teams were actually uh, kind enough to give me some very direct and open feedback. And, then I could see where my path forward was. Some of that was discovering things like local meetups and uh, through speaking at local JavaScript meetups and things, I would connect with folks and uh, ask them questions and then I'd get feed up, feedback that way. Eventually I started learning where there, the resources on career progression, certain blog posts and, and things like that were and I would find those resources. But I really had to kind of gather all that together on my own. I think we as a community, uh, and especially those of us that are at a certain level in our career, we could do more to help the people uh, that are next in line, uh, give them some guidance and, and kind of illuminate that path forward. But why? Why, uh, why would you want to do this? Because it's certainly not your responsibility. Um, I would say from, from my own observation that it, it benefits you and your team. Uh, 
it also benefits the community. And, and all of us, if we work in open source software, we depend on that community pretty heavily. And it's also not as hard as you might think. If we just really kind of think about the problem. But it is a big problem. And so where do we start? And this talk is uh, not long enough to, to kind of cover the whole issue. So really, I'm just trying to get the conversation started. And so I'm going to pick one area where I feel that we could have a lot of impact. Um, it certainly did in my case. Obviously, that area is interviews. So I, I think interviews are a great place to start because from a company perspective, there's obvious benefits. Obviously, we have lots of jobs to fill. And if we can't staff our teams correctly, then that means we can't move as quickly and we can't execute, execute on those ideas that help our business to grow. Uh, also, these are good jobs. They're, they tend to be fairly lucrative. Uh, and it's not like manual labor where it kind of drags down on your body or, and, and things like that. Um, so we're also helping people kind of have a better quality of life. But it's also an interview is kind of like a, it's kind of like an exam that you go through, uh, maybe even a gauntlet. But the benefit of it is that it really showcases where your strengths and your weaknesses are. And it would be great to surface those in that place where we can really see them highlighted and give some really good feedback. But I, I definitely don't want to say that interviews are broken and, and, and they're just terrible. Uh, so what is working? Well, currently, when we think about the, the common things in technical software engineering interviews, uh, I see some positives. We have high standards, and that's great because if we are keeping a high standard of code quality within our cur current code base, we want new people to be onboarded and have that same level of quality as they add to our code base. We also kind of focus on team impact. So when we're interviewing people, we're not just thinking, uh, am I as the hiring manager, do I think this person is competent and will work well with me? Uh, it's more about thinking about my entire team and how is this person going to fit in with that entire dynamic? Or how are their strengths and weaknesses going to, uh, going to complement other people on my team? And that's a common thing that I think we, we definitely want to keep. We also value experience overhead knowledge. So what, what does that actually mean? Uh, so by saying that, what I mean is if you've got a CS degree, that's great. But that's usually not the content of the interview. It's usually, can you write some code? Uh, can you diagram the theory of how a, a particular program or function will work? Uh, we really want to see if you can like actually do stuff versus just having a great looking resume. And in all industries, that's, that's not the case. So what are some areas where we could improve? I think we as companies and teams could be really clear about what we value on our team. I think we could work hard to identify the traits that are actually going to matter to our organization. And then we could take just a little bit of effort to give some useful feedback for that candidate. Uh, whether or not they make it through, that's going to be very valuable for them. And just a couple sentences of, of really honest and direct feedback was very impactful in my career, and I think it would be for others. So as teams, what do you value? Johnny Ray Austin gave a, a, an awesome talk yesterday called A Theory of Everything. And one of the sort of key aspects that I took out of that is this concept of teams coming up with a set of core values for their engineering organization what's really valuable on my team. And so the benefit of that is when I interview candidates, now I can interview in terms of values, which transcend culture and uh, personal backgrounds and things like that. They're really about the way this person works and how they're going to be effective on my team. 
And so I can see, uh, not do I like hanging out with this person, I can see do they align with the values on my team. And if there's alignment and there is a certain level of technical qualification, then they're probably a, a good match. So obviously values differ by team. So this is kind of one of those it depends moments. I'm not gonna prescribe anything uh, because everybody has different business use cases. Everybody has different environments they work with. Uh, but if you're not really sure, I'm gonna give some examples of things that I've seen that are, they tend to be valuable across engineering organizations. So if you're looking for those diamonds in the rough, maybe people that don't come from a traditional background, uh, maybe t people that would be great on your team and you might otherwise pass them by if all you focus on is how, how well they do on a whiteboard interview. Uh, here's some things I, I think are valuable to kind of look for. Uh, communication, curiosity, passion, and determination. And, and there's many more good attributes. Those are just kind of, I, I had to pick some and this talk couldn't be three hours long. Uh, so that's kind of what I picked. But what you'll see is these don't really focus on that technical competency. Yes, that needs to be there. But I think if you're really focused on hiring by values, you'll know when the technical competency is there and you'll know when the technical competency is, is close and maybe their values align so closely with your teams that maybe it's worth a little bit of investment to hire them and, and help quickly get them up to speed on the technical side. So let's take communication. Why does that matter? Uh, people that are good communicators tend to be good at receiving and understanding feedback. Uh, they'll, they'll also ask for help. Uh, they have empathy. And, and because of that, they also tend to help others and, and also be effective at helping others. But what would this actually look like in an interview? And, and I should also say that for most of these slides, I'm, I'm sort of talking to that person that would be a mentor, a hiring manager, uh, someone more senior. But if you happen to be in that junior level, look out for these attributes. These are things you should be trying to emulate if you want to get that next great job. So what would this actually look like in an interview? Well, we'd be looking for people that can very easily explain concepts in, in just kind of common language. Because that, that usually gives a sense that you, you've kind of done some programming and, and, and you, really, you really get how things work. Uh, people that also don't just recite their job history, but they can kind of tell you like a, a story. Like what is the actual career progression and how does that fit in with your life? And not just I worked here, then I worked here, then I worked here. Uh, people that tend to be conversational. So they're calm, they, they, maybe they ask the interviewer uh, how their day was, uh, what's your family like, that kind of thing. Um, that, that tends to be a sign that someone's just, they're just naturally very good at communication. And someone that also is able to use the feedback that an interviewer will give to effectively sort of get themselves unstuck because these technical interviews, they, they can be pretty intense and you will get stuck, that's just what happens. Someone that's good at uh, taking and giving feedback, that's good at that communication though, will be able to use that and effectively get themselves unstuck. So curiosity, curiosity, excuse me. Uh, the curious person uh, is one that I think of that they kind of take the initiative to find out how things work. They were the, the kid that was maybe uh, opening up VCRs to like figure out what, what went on in there. And they're also the person that like wants to understand what the runtime of the language is doing. Because of that, they tend to be great debuggers because they don't just see an error and think, okay, that's the fix. They wonder why did that error happen? Could it have been triggered by something else in the system? And they tend to think at a very high systems level and uh, understand the connections that things have 
within a software system. And there are also challenges existing assumptions. So oftentimes when we've been working on a team for a while and, and that team's been pretty cohesive, uh, there are things that we may be doing, things in our code base that are, they're working, but maybe they could be better. And a curious person can come into your organization, maybe they'll ask the question, like why, why is this done this way? And if, if that answer is just because it is, uh, you kind of want that person to, to kind of push a little more and say, oh, have you considered this? Could it be done this way? Uh, it, it's not to say that, that your existing way is wrong, but there is value in having that person that's gonna ask, why is this this way? So what's this look like in an interview? Again, this is the type of person who asks the why questions. Um, maybe they're given a problem uh, given a list of integers uh, that's unordered, uh, sort them, something, something like that. I probably should have thought of an example ahead of time. Uh, but anyway, they, they, they would probably ask, well, uh, why are we sorting this? Where did this data come from? Who's gonna use the data after it's sorted? Uh, just things like that. Like they, they wanna dig a little deeper until they can fully understand the problem. And that, that type of thinking is, is very valuable to have on your team. So also, if they don't know something, they know where to look it up. So this is the type of person that maybe when they get an error message, they don't just go to Stack Overflow. I, I work with JavaScript a lot. Uh, so maybe they go to MDN to like actually find out why a function works this way uh, why concat returns a copy of an array and push just manipulates the existing array. Uh, they, they actually want to know that and they know where to look that up if they don't already know the answer. So they probably also tried a few programming languages, not, uh, not in a practical sense, maybe they don't work with these day to day, but they're just interested in like, how do things work over here? Uh, if they've written JavaScript, uh, maybe they've tried out Elm, Maybe they've tried out Reason. Uh, maybe they've tried out back-end languages like Rust. But they, they've, they've kind of tried some things and, and they, that's enabled them to kind of think about problems in a different way versus someone that's only worked with like their most loved language. And as a bonus, uh, when they get stuck on something in the interview, uh, this curious person, that's not gonna be good enough for them to just kind of go home, they're actually gonna research, like why, why didn't that work for me? Uh, and they'll probably follow up with the interviewer to say, hey, that, that error that I made, I, I was able to research it and this is what I did wrong, uh, this is what I actually should have done, and, and I, I learned some stuff. Uh, so yeah, if, if you ever get one of those follow-up emails, uh, that's probably a person to, to maybe give a second look. Uh, passion. So the, the passionate person is someone that takes pride in their work, they're always trying to improve. They're also gonna be very motivating because they're very energetic about their work. And they'll take the initiative to learn new things and also kind of share that with their team. What do they look like in an interview? They're probably a person that has side projects and things that they've built just for fun. Uh, they are the type of person who, they're attending meetups and also participating in those meetups. So maybe they've given even just a lightning talk. Maybe they've written blog posts, a uh, YouTube channel, in any of these things. Uh, depending on your situation, if, if you are this person, don't think that you have to be giving talks. While that is great, don't think that you have to be building toy projects. Uh, people have families and they have lives and, and circumstances differ. Um, but there should be some sign that you are doing things outside of work just because you love writing software so much that you can't contain it. And that should come out in some way uh, that the interviewer can see. And so if that's not apparent, like highlight that. And if you were the interviewer, try to, try to push. Just kind of ask, uh, I see this stuff on your resume. 
Uh, what, what else do you do that's code related be, beside your day to day job? And I've also kind of noticed this trend that they tend to be passionate about something else outside of their technical domain. So maybe they run, uh, maybe they lift weights, maybe they're big into music, maybe they like, they like baking. Um, I, I've seen lots of different passions. Uh, some can just be really into reading and literature and, and, and things like that. Uh, but they tend to be passionate about something that kind of helps them step away from their work, but also keeps their brain active in some manner. Usually you can ask them uh, to give you like one favorite book, technical and non-technical. And they will very quickly kind of have an answer for you there. So determination, why, why is this important? Uh, well, we want people on our teams who aren't gonna give up. So this person will have sort of shown that uh, throughout their life, they, they have not given up on things. Because of that, they're not, they don't have a tendency to complain, but they'll actually propose solutions. This is the type of person that says, hey, this isn't working for me. Uh, I think this could fix it, but I'm not able to do that for some reason. Or I've already tried this, this, and this. Uh, what am I missing? Because if you can give me that missing piece, I can go back and fix it myself. So they're very motivated to, to help rather than just complain that things aren't going their way. They also tend to show empathy for others because they maybe had some struggles. They understand that people struggle and uh, that tends to make them a little bit more empathetic. So what does this look like in an interview? Uh, usually they can talk about some things that, that maybe didn't go quite right in their life. This can be technical, this can be non-technical, whatever. Uh, just they understand that things are not always rosy and, and sometimes things go wrong in the world. They can also speak about positive impacts that they've had in someone else's life. Maybe this is helping uh, someone else learn to code. Uh, maybe this is helping a family member uh, out of a financial struggle. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Just You can see that they value having a positive impact in other lives and they have some concrete examples to show of when they've helped with that. They also tend to stay calm and positive uh, when an interviewer isn't going their way. Uh, this is very difficult for me, and it still is when I get stressed, like I just, I get bummed. And, uh, but I have definitely seen that the more I work on this, it, it makes a really positive impact. And from a working perspective, if you're building non-trivial software, things are not gonna go your way most of the time. There, there will be struggles. So you want the person that is comfortable being uncomfortable and can still remain positive and st can still kind of lift everyone else up. And, and this person can also talk about some tough choices they've made to kind of get something done. Especially in terms of software, I was chatting with some folks last night about kind of signs that they use to, to see what level a person is at in their software development career uh, when they're interviewing. And one of the questions they like to ask is, uh, like, what do you hate most about software? And if someone can like give you a good story about that, they've probably been through some struggles. They've probably written a lot of software to get to that point because if you're just kind of following along with tutorials uh, for this or that framework, you don't really get to the point where there's a thing that you hate. That kind of takes some experience to get to that point. So uh, those are just some examples. Uh, maybe all of those don't align with your team's goals. But say that you have identified what your team's values are and you're interviewing a person, what if they are a good fit? Or excuse me, what if they're just not a good fit? Uh, this could be because maybe their technical skills just aren't there yet. And they, they kind of align with a lot of those values, but the technical skills just aren't there. Uh, we still do need to write software at the end of the day. And if, if they were like me and couldn't write a for loop, that's a problem. So what do we do in that situation? Well, I think we should give some honest and actionable feedback. 
And here are some examples, or here, here's an example. So it, it'd be okay, and, and there's a lot of feedback like this that people will give, uh, that your technical skills weren't as solid as we would have liked. I realize that font's kind of thin, uh, so I'm not sure if you guys can see that, but uh, your technical skills weren't as solid as we would have liked. So that's okay. I know it, it had to do with my technical skills, but I don't really know what I need to work on from that feedback. So here's another example. Uh, you've got a good grasp of the fundamentals, but you seem to struggle at finding the most optimal solution to the problem. I'd suggest you brush up on your algorithms. So it's a slight change, but I know exactly what I need to go learn. Uh, if I know nothing of algorithms, I know I need to like start with what's an algorithm and how do you get good at that. If I know that they gave me a very specific algorithm that I hadn't seen before, I know I need to brush up on those types of algorithms and data structures that are good at solving those. So I can use this and actually go and level up. And I also want to say that I, I know that there are, there are reasons that companies don't give feedback. Some of them are for legal reasons, some of them are just for PR. Uh, sometimes you don't feel comfortable from an organizational level giving good detailed feedback. But I'd suggest really thinking about if there's good reasons for those, and if there isn't some kind of way that we can provide useful feedback for the candidate. So what if they are a great fit? Awesome, you're done. Not really. So now the real building begins. We can build up a candidate who maybe didn't work out by kind of giving them uh, a nugget of knowledge that they can take and, and progress with that. But if somebody is a good fit and we actually want to onboard them on our team, uh, then, we've, then we've got a little bit more work to do. So I'd suggest having a detailed plan for success. Uh, think about what they need to do on their first day to be successful. Think about how soon they can get into actually writing code and, and committing code into your code base. And it'd be great if you could think about a first project that they can just dive into right away and also the, any, any support or assistance that they'll need to be successful throughout that process. It, it'd also be great to designate one person they can go with or, or go to with any questions, concerns they have. Uh, maybe they're just kind of overwhelmed because uh, if we're trying to have them dive in to the code base as soon as possible, that can be overwhelming. Uh, so it'd be great to designate one person and say, hey, if you have any concerns, go to this person. They're here for you. Give them a project as soon as possible so they get an immediate sense of how your team works, what the pace of your work is, uh, things like your code style, and, and uh, all of those things that are very crucial to working effectively as teams. Help them dive into that as soon as possible. And, and that is going to stress them out. I went through this process. Uh, but it was very helpful to have people check in with me regularly and remind me of where I could go to for support in those situations. And, and so some examples of that uh, were, uh, if your team does lots of pair programming and that's very important, uh, like pair with them as often as possible for that first two to three months. Uh, if, if code quality and, and sort of cross-team communication is very important, do lots of code reviews. The company I work for, communication is very important. Uh, across the entire company, not just engineering. And so uh, my first three months I was doing code reviews, uh, either having my code review with someone to understand the style of the code uh, and what the, what the standards were, or also reviewing other people's code, which was a really good way to get a sense for uh, what I should be shooting for. So that is a lot of work, and I mentioned benefits. What are the benefits? So from the company and you and your team's perspective, uh, you're going to get varied perspectives in your organization. And this does tend to raise the level and quality of your code because you kind of have more checks to make sure that you're doing the right thing. 
you're going to build sort of a growth mindset across your team because if you're working hard to onboard new folks and help them kind of level up quickly, other people within the organization already are going to take advantage of that. And pretty soon your entire team is going to be thinking about growth and you'll be doing better work. And also, I, I've seen this with companies that I've gotten very good feedback from, that candidates will refer other people and you will have a ton of candidates, uh, which increases the amount of really good candidates and those jobs will stay open for shorter times. So what are the benefits to the community? Well, I think we get, uh, we kind of raise the level of the engineering skills across our community. Again, most of us work with open source technologies in some way, and so uh, as we build up the community, we all kind of benefit from that. We'll start to define better resources for these new people, so it'll be very clear where new people can go to get the resources for whatever level they happen to be in their career. And then we'll be able to m build more cool things, which is, uh, that's kind of my goal. So what else can you do? Uh, well, me volunteering at meetups is a, is a really good place to start. Uh, maybe your team can host a meetup. Uh, maybe you can send some of your more qualified engineers to kind of speak at meetups about things that are very important to your organization. That'll be a signal to new people attending those meetups that, hey, you're a company, if that aligns with my values, you're a company I want to work for. I think I want to apply there. Uh, apprenticeships are also a very good thing. Um, I know there are some companies doing this. Uh, if, if more people could do it, I, I think it's something that we all should kind of consider and, and consider what does that look like for our budget and, and uh, what kind of resources can we allocate for that. Mentor at events like RailsBridge, Free Code Camp was really helpful to me. Um, RustBridge was just mentioned. Uh, th there's tons of organizations like this that kind of reach out to people who wouldn't traditionally be found in our community. Uh, mentor at some of those. What you're doing is letting people know that you're out there and that you care about them and kind of align with their values. Uh, once they get to the point where their technical skills are useful to you, they're probably going to apply at your company or refer other, other people who are qualified to apply at your company. And then publish and speak about your values. One thing that, I, that really kind of stood out to me when I looked into Riskalyze was that not only on the website do we have the entire company's core values listed out, but every single person that I talked to from my initial phone screen through all of my interviews uh, everyone actually seemed to stand by those core values, and I could kind of remember them and remember people's interactions and think, oh, this is that one. Okay, they actually do kind of stand by these core values. So publish and, and, and speak about those values and let other people know if they have that same sort of value alignment, uh, that you're there and that you're probably a good place to work for. So. Uh, I don't want to make this talk spiritual or anything like that, but I, I actually found a, a really nice quote uh, from the Bible, and I thought it really kind of summed up what I wanted to say. Uh, so it, it says, you received free, give free. And for context, this was kind of Jesus sending his apostles. He had just given them powers to, to do miracles and cure people and, and, and all that great stuff. But what he was saying was, go out into the community and take these gifts that I've given you and kind of spread them around. Uh, but don't charge anyone, because I gave them to you for free, so give them to others for free. I think this really kind of applies and can be useful for us to think about as an open source community, that most of us depend on open source, and, and that's been very valuable for our careers. But that means that most of our careers are based on us getting things for free. So I think it'd be great if we could spend just a little bit of time and effort to give something free to that next person in line who maybe isn't sure what they should do next. Um, and that's really just my encouragement to everybody. Uh, we received free, get free. So thank you, I, I think we're about out of time for questions, um, but you can find me on Twitter and GitHub at Dalton A. Mitchell, uh, and that's my email. Uh, I'll be here for the rest of the conference, so uh, I'm happy to chat and answer more questions about this. Thanks.